для советского народа это была Великая Отечественная война. Он вел ее во имя свободы и независимости своей социалистической родины, во имя избавления Европы, да и всего мира от фашистского порабощения. 20 миллионов жизней советских людей унесла эта война. Наш народ не забудет ее никогда. Леонид Ильич Брежнев. I'm Bert Lancaster. In World War II, the Russians were fighting along a 2,000-mile line, which extended from the Black Sea to a point beyond the Arctic Circle. This is the Black Sea, and here is the ice-free seaport of Murmansk, in the northernmost part of the Soviet Union. Arms and supplies from the United States and Great Britain came by convoy to this very spot in the harbor of Murmansk. The route of the supply ships which cut through the Arctic Sea was so perilous that the seamen on the convoys often called it Death Alley. The convoys, identified by the code initials PQ, were in constant danger from Nazi submarines and planes. The Germans, based on the northern tip of Norway, made daily attacks on the ships. One convoy in particular, The PQ-17 sustained enormous losses. Out of 37 ships, only 13 managed to reach Murmansk. $700 million dollars in cargo went down to the bottom of the Arctic Sea. But the real loss was in human lives. American, British, and Russian men lie here in the cemetery of the Allied forces in Murmansk, killed in their attempt to bring food, tanks, and other supplies to the Russian people. Russell Bennett, ordinary seaman, United States Merchant Marine. J.J. Connolly, Maritime Regiment Royal Artillery, British. Alexei Prokhorov, Russian seaman. These men gave their lives in a common cause in the unknown war. Now, our story, War in the Arctic. northern ice cap of the world lies the Arctic Ocean. Perpetually cold, shaken by sudden storms, its waters are never at rest. This is the sea road to Russia's northern ports of Murmansk and Archangel, by way of the Barents Sea in the North Atlantic. In the unknown war, a battlefield. Only the strong moved in these lands of winter. Much of the year, the pack ice encroaches on the sea lanes. Often mist and fog blanket the route. Two years before the war, a Soviet polar expedition trekked over the ice fields to investigate the strategic and scientific possibilities of the Arctic. Its leader was Ivan Papanin, who shortly was to put his knowledge to military use. Others were on reconnaissance. The ships and planes of Nazi Germany, harbingers of the coming conflict. 
On April 9, 1940, the Germans assaulted Norway, whose northern coastline jutted into the Arctic sea lanes. The barren mountains of the north were rich in cobalt, copper, nickel. Strategic materials vital to the German war machine. to Russia on June 22, 1941. Using its Norwegian bases, the German Navy roamed through the Barren Straits, intent on closing Murmansk, Russia's only northern port that was ice-free year-round. The German capital ships were new and powerful. Soviet shore batteries included one commanded by a Siberian officer called Kosmachov. In the course of the war, Kosmachov's battery was hit by 25,000 large caliber shells and bombs. On the first day of the war, they claimed their first victory. For Kosmachov's battery, it was a long and bitter war. Though the Germans enjoyed air superiority in the Arctic, they could not exercise it with impunity. Northern fleet was a new creation. It did not have many ships, but they were among the most modern. Its installations and the men who manned them were new and young. Its commander, Admiral Arseny Golovko, was only 35. Talented and aggressive Golovko had put his fleet on red alert the night before the German invasion on orders from the commander in chief of the Soviet Navy. The German army's invasion route would cross northern Finland, heading for the White Sea. The Germans sent in specialized troops, mountain infantry from Tyrol and Bavaria, supported by Finnish ski troops. The Wehrmacht's successes in Norway had been swift, and the troops were confident. Before long, the familiar marks of the Blitzkrieg began to appear in the Soviet Arctic. Back in Germany, they enjoyed the newsreels showing how easy it all was, what fun the troops were having in the lands they conquered.
congratulated themselves. Murmansk was only 40 miles away. Close Murmansk, and Russia would be cut off from Western aid. The mission of the Luftwaffe was to destroy the port city and to deny traffic in and out by sea. German schedule called for the capture of Murmansk in a month, but only a few Nazis were allowed to set foot in it. Others met their end in the harbor waters. There were lulls in the Arctic War, moments when life seemed almost normal. The defenders of Murmansk knew, however, that the issue would be decided at sea. The Germans had been halted on land, but on the open ocean, they were paramount. Murmansk was an important submarine base. The Soviet boats ranged through the Barents Sea and along the Norwegian coast, hunting the freighters carrying ore for Germany's steel mills. This submarine was built with contributions from the children of Siberia. This is its dedication ceremony. The submarine's commander was Captain Fisanovich, made a hero of the Soviet Union for sinking 12 freighters and transports. After the United States entered the war, he and others also received American decorations. Fisanovich pledged his life to the Allied cause. Soon afterwards, the pledge was honored. His submarine was lost at sea. While the land war in the far north was at a stalemate, the ocean battle increased in ferocity. The Murmansk route was the corridor through which supplies from America and Britain could come. The Germans were determined to dominate it with their superior forces. fields everywhere to catch whatever eluded the bombers and the warships.
One of the best remembered of the Soviet commanders is Nikolai Lunin. His tally of enemy warships and transports sunk totaled 13. Lunin later joined the Allied attack on the German battleship Tirpitz. There was a custom when the Soviet subs came home. A one-gun salute for each enemy ship sunk. domestic customs. And the congratulations of comrades. It was the most remote of battles out of sight in the cold reaches of the ocean. A lonely fight. And an own end. The first winter of the war found the Wehrmacht's northernmost units blocked, frozen to the ground. There would be 311 days of blizzards and extreme frost. <laughs> This was a relatively quiet front. Further south, their comrades were suffering under the full weight of the Red Army. Up here, there was nothing worse than a dose of cod liver oil. They were very far from home in this white wilderness. Soviet raids came with terrifying speed. Soviet marines would race across the tundra and strike ferociously. There was no warning. destroy the supply lines and vanish into the ice fields. The Germans had no means of countering the raids. They contented themselves with methodical shelling and occasional armored sallies, but the most they gained was a few settlements and Soviet outposts.
the Nazis were more successful. There were few days or nights when the fires did not burn in Murmansk. The Nazis turned Murmansk into a heap of rubble, but they could not prevent it from operating. Former Arctic explorer, now Admiral Ivan Papanin, commanded in Murmansk. Papanin had an old friend, Vladimir Voronin, captain of the old icebreaker, Sibiryakov. In 1932, Voronin sailed the Sibiryakov on an epic first voyage through the ice of the Northern Sea Route from the Pacific to the Barents Sea. Early in the war, the Sibiryakov fell afoul of the German battleship Admiral Scheer and was destroyed. German capital ships were concentrated in these northern waters to annihilate the vital convoy. surface lurked wolf packs of German submarines. Inshore, small craft of the Soviet fleet attacked the German boats. With half of her industrial capacity moved to the east and not yet in full production, and her armies hard pressed, the Soviet Union needed all the help she could get. Much of that help must sail the Nazi gauntlet, deployed across the North Atlantic. It was a high-risk venture. The first convoys left Britain in March 1942. Not all the ships made it to Murvansk. Late in June 1942, the Western Allies assembled the biggest convoy yet, codenamed PQ-17. 37 American, Canadian, and British ships. Waiting for it was the main strength of the German Navy. The capital ships, Tirpitz, Hippa, Scheer, and Lutzow, and 10 destroyers also the dive bombers and torpedo bombers of the Luftwaffe squadrons in Norway. PQ-17's escort consisted of six destroyers and two anti-aircraft ships. It was a voyage of 10 to 14 days with air cover only at the beginning and at the end. Nazi wolf packs all the way. To July 4th, PQ-17 lost only one ship. Two had been damaged and turned back. It was north of the Norwegian coast when disaster hit. The British Admiral Tovey, in command, believing the German fleet was approaching, ordered the convoy to disperse. It was suicidal. 
The ships were loaded with tanks, food, shell presses, medical supplies, and thousands of tons of high explosives. The German bombers hunted down their scattered targets one by one. PQ-17 lost 24 of its 37 ships, $700 million worth of cargo sunk. Soviets did what they could to help, shepherding the surviving vessels of PQ-17 into Murmans. But Churchill, deeming the losses intolerable, suspended the convoys. They were not resumed until September 1942, when the days grew shorter. PQ-18 was sent out, a total of 40 ships. Luftwaffe found PQ-18 far from a friendly shore, off John Mayer Island, south of Greenland. Of the convoy's 40 ships, 13 sank in a running battle that exhausted the gun crews. Once more, Churchill suspended the convoys. Some small convoys, a handful of ships, were sent out that winter, reaching Archangel and Murmansk in relative safety. Surviving the Murmansk run seemed miraculous. In all, throughout the war, some 60 ships were lost. 811 warships and freighters made it. None did so easily. At the best of times, it was a hazardous journey. Through unpredictable storms and pitch black fog, the sea was so cold that anyone lost overboard had no hope of survival. As a battlefield, it was a nightmare. It cost the lives of thousands of American, British, and Soviet sailors. Massive material poured into Murmansk, over $15 billion worth in the United States, Britain, and Canada. 10,800 tanks, 18,700 aircraft, 9,600 artillery pieces, heavy industrial machinery, trucks, hospital equipment, and medical supplies. special gift, an 
American destroyer ready for action. The Soviets named it Murmansk. Many planes came in by a different route, ferried by Soviet pilots, headed by the polar ace Ilya Mazuruk, now a retired Air Force general. In the difficult years of World War II, I was head of the air route between Alaska and Siberia. This is the route. We received Era Cobras and other planes from Allied America. American pilots brought them from the plants to Fairbanks. And from Fairbanks, the aircraft were taken over by our flyers. They went from Fairbanks to Nome, through the Bering Straits, through all of central Chukotka, to Yakutia, and through Siberia to the front. Трасса была необыкновенно суровой, 60-градусные лютые морозы, безлюдные места, климатические условия были необыкновенно суровыми. Ну, например... But it was a long way to the front. These complicated and sensitive aircraft had to go another 10,000 kilometers or more under hard weather conditions. The route was unbelievably difficult, 60 degrees below zero uninhabited in places, and unusually severe climatic conditions. For instance, a flyer might have to make a forced landing in the mountains. For a whole month, we would have to fly in food for him. We didn't have helicopters then, so he was rescued by a deer sledge. We took about 2,000 planes a year on that route. Our factories had already made 40,000 planes. The war took many a plane, but this assistance was very symbolic due to our friendship and purposefulness. It's been a long time, but I still remember the friends that I made among the Americans, like Kachigman, Major Mibik, the base commanders. I still have a photograph. He signed it to my best friend, Colonel Mazaruk. For the rest of my life, I will always be grateful to those Americans who gave us so much help. I hope I was able to return some of their kindness when I rescued many American and British sailors whose ships had been torpedoed in the Barents Sea. Some of the Allied commanders and diplomats visited Murmansk. Andrei Gromyko, Soviet ambassador to the United States and Averill Harriman, American ambassador to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Embassy in London, 1942. Mrs. Churchill attends the reception with Soviet ambassador Maisky. A presentation of Soviet decorations to Royal Air Force officers for combat against the common enemy. Squadrons of British fighter planes were assigned to the Arctic War. They and their Soviet allies had more than one interest in common.
local transportation in the Arctic was adapted to wartime use. Much of the ordnance for the polar bases came into Murmansk by ship, from Murmansk by less orthodox means. Air war in the Arctic called for special skills. The nature of the terrain and climate made extra demands. Some of the pilots became aces. The most famous of these was Boris Safonov. Safonov made his first kill on the second day of the war. His total eventually came to 22. Whenever an opportunity presented itself, Safonov took it. Safonov, a son of a farmer, was a member of the Communist Party. He rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the Naval Air Force. The first Soviet pilot to be made a hero of the Soviet Union twice over, he also collected British awards for valor. Boris Safonov did not live to enjoy the peace. He was killed flying protection over an Allied convoy. In 1944, the Red Army was everywhere on the attack. The Soviet High Command completed its plans for the Arctic Front. Its troops in Karelia were to break through to Petsamo and Pechenga. The blow fell early in the morning of October 7th, 1944. Soviet commander, General Kirill Meritskov, later Marshal Meritskov, wrote, the same divisions that had blocked the panzers from advancing to Murmansk went into battle. They were hardened soldiers, reliable and courageous fighters. Meritskov continued, just a short while before, the Nazis used to surrender only in rare cases. But here, thousands of them gave themselves up understanding that otherwise they could only await a different end.
impossibly hard. In parts of it, only the infantry could move, taking with them only what they could haul with their own hands. It took a week to reach Pechenga, fighting all the way, both the Nazis and the terrain. Salt went in on October 14th under the guns of the Arctic fleet, from the sea and by land. Fighting in the town was bitter, but by next morning, Pechenga had been freed. Once more the paradox, the town had to be destroyed in order to achieve its liberation. By a miracle, the church had survived, as it had for 400 years. October 21st, the Karelian army reached the Norwegian frontier. Two days later, it took Nikel. On October 25th, Kerkenes. Eventually, the Germans destroyed everything they could. This was once the biggest nickel mine and smelter in Europe. of Nazi oppression, the Norwegians greeted the Soviets with open arms. They had fought well themselves, underground, as saboteurs and spies. Jews despised the Nazis. Now the long nightmare was over. They had been given back their pride.
people of Norway still bring tributes to the monument they built to the soldiers of the Red Army. The many who died furthest north in the unknown war. Another monument in Murmansk, erected and kept by the Soviets in memory of the losses of their allies and the victory they won side by side. The victory that brought Murmansk, Archangel, and the Arctic Seas back to their peaceful purposes. next story, War in the Air. On the first day of the Nazi surprise attack, the Red Air Force lost half of its combat planes. Yet by the end of the war, the Soviets had accounted for 20,000 German pilots. Many planes made in the United States took part in that battle, one of the least reported in the unknown war. 